Professor, tell us a little bit about your background. I actually was a student of George Wald. I don't know whether you know that name or not, but he's the one who discovered the role of vitamin A in vision way back in the early 30s. I don't go back quite that far, but uh, he showed that uh, indeed the visual pigments, the light sensitive molecules in the eye consist of a chromophore, a modified form of vitamin A, vitamin A aldehyde, bound to a protein which we've always called opsin. And this holds for both the rods and the cones. And uh, he then carried forward that story until he retired in the 60s. And at that point, he won a Nobel Prize for that work. So I uh, started working for George in the mid-50s as an undergraduate and then continued on um, after two years of medical school, at which point I took a leave of absence to go back and work with Dr. Wald, still on that leave of absence, but uh, worked as uh, uh, on vitamin A deficiency and night blindness for my PhD thesis, uh, we first used retinoic acid to confine the deficiency just to the eye because it turns out that the visual pigments require vitamin A aldehyde and uh, that has to come from vitamin A. Retinoic acid, on the other hand, seems to um, uh, substitute for all um, of the functions of vitamin A other than that in the eye. So that was my PhD thesis, and then I stayed on at Harvard for three years uh, uh, teaching and then also um, studying various aspects of photoreceptor function. And then um, I moved to Johns Hopkins in 1964, and the, my research changed at that point. I became much more interested not in photoreceptor mechanisms, but in retinal mechanisms and uh, much of my career has been spent studying retinal mechanisms. First was interested in the wiring of the eye, how do the various cells talk to one another, what are the various cells in the retina, and so on and so forth. And we spent a number of years looking at then the wiring, the circuitry, if you will, of the, of the retina. And uh, then went on with students to study the physiological properties of the retinal cells, recording intracellularly from each of the types of cells. Early on, we used uh, amphibian retinas that have large cells, and so on and so forth. From there, we went on to the pharmacology of the retina. What are the chemicals used by various retinal neurons to communicate information, both fast excitatory and inhibitory? Uh, responses as well as neuromodulatory effects. And then in more recent years, I uh, became interested in retinal genetics, and for that we worked with zebrafish, whose genome can be modified very readily. But that led us into another aspect of retinal function, and that is color vision, because zebrafish, like many fish, uh, have very sensitive and effective color vision systems. For example, they have four types of cones, we have just three. And uh, then uh, two years ago, I uh, closed my laboratory, semi-retired, and uh, at that point did what I call my first postdoctoral fellowship, because when I graduated with my PhD with George Wald, I immediately um, had a position at Harvard to help teach a new course that he was formulating and never had the opportunity for a postdoc. So what I did then was to approach a colleague of mine, Jeff Flickman, who has developed many of the techniques that we now have to three-dimensionally reconstruct pieces of neural tissue. And uh, what I was interested in doing and told Jeff this is what I thought was an important thing to do, was to reconstruct the human fovea. Uh, at that point, it, we talked about it as the primate fovea. We didn't know whether we would have access to uh, human eyes or not. But at about the same time, uh, two friends from the University of Washington, Dennis Dacey and Rachel Wong, uh, contacted Jeff and said they would be interested in reconstructing the human fovea, and they had access to human eyes. So. We said, let's all join forces, and so we have a team of Jeff Fleckman, Dennis Dacey, Rachel Wong, myself, and then one of Jeff's uh, research associates, Richard Shalick. 
and we've been working on the project for just over a year. We started approximately in September 2015, attempting to reconstruct the human fovea. Uh, of course, the fovea is our most important part of the retina without doubt, and it's astonishing how little we know about it. What we know about it really comes mainly from the studies that Stephen Polyak did back in the 30s. He was the first one to show that there's a one-to-one -one pathway from cones to ganglion cells and then on to the rest of the brain. And the picture that we always show is Polyak's classic drawing of the late 1930s. Uh, and uh, so it was time really to look at this in three dimensions and down to the synapse level. So we began uh, by fixing uh, an eye that Dennis Stacy was able to get a young man who was riding a motorcycle without a helmet. And uh, as you could imagine, uh, when he had the accident, uh, he was very badly brain damaged, but his eyes were not. But when they finally decided to withdraw um, support from him, Dennis was able to get his eyes promptly to fix them and bed them, and then sent them to us, who started the business of serially sectioning the uh, central retina, including the fovea. So far we've cut about uh, 4,000 sections, 65 nanometers thickness. Uh, we have um, imaged 1,500 of those sections, uh, beginning at the inner segment level and going down to where the photoreceptors contact the second order cells, so just the outer part of the retina. And we in doing that, we had our first big surprise. Whereas Polyak had said that all of the pedicles, all of the synaptic terminals of the foveal cones, including those in the very center, uh, sit around the rim of the fovea. And of course, the fovea is indented, forming the foveal pit. It turns out that that's not the case. Indeed, the pedicles for the very central cones sit right underneath those central cones in the foveal pit. So that there is maintained then something that has long puzzled people studying the fovea, and that is if the photoreceptors have to go off in different directions to find their pedicles, how can there be a topographic representation of the visual field? How can the diffuse bipolar cells contact uh, um, adjacent cells. How can the pedicles, which we know contact one another, do that if the pedicles are very far away? And so that was the first big surprise we got in this, uh, in this study. And it's, the story's not complete yet, but it's clear that we're going to learn new things. Uh, what we've seen so far is that the connections that are made by those central pedicles are similar to what have been seen outside the fovea, uh, and sort of confirming the kinds of findings that we made back in the 1960s when I was studying the circuitry of the primate retina. That was at the Wilmer Institute. And a second important discovery that we've made, and I'm pretty sure it's correct, is that there are two types of Mueller cells in the central fovea. The classic Mueller cell, it sends a, a process all the way to the external limiting membrane, which has been known for decades, if not centuries, but also a second Mueller cell. We call it an inner Mueller cell that doesn't send that process way up to the external limiting membrane, but ends around the pedicles, which these inner cells uh, do surround. We have much more to do to find out how far out those uh, intermuller cells extend. Are they confined just to the foveal pit or go beyond into the parafovea? We don't know that. How far down do they go? Do they go to the inner limiting membrane as do the Mueller cells? We don't know that. So uh, it, we've made, we think, a terrific start and we already have learned some very nice things. Why do we need to know about the fine structure and the details of the fovea, because if we're ever, ever to be able to provide 
high acuity vision to people who are blind. We need to know how the fovea works. That's where our, all of our high acuity vision occurs. So there it is, in a nutshell, is sort of what I've been doing for the last 60 years. That, that's a beautiful exposition. So what are the potential implications for AMD? Okay, well that's a different story. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, one, if we're to understand AMD, we really need to know what's going on in the fovea, paraphobia, paraphobia. Okay, I'll tell you my ideas with regard to what's happening in AMD. Not everyone agrees, but uh, I think the the view that I have is becoming accepted by a number of people, and they're not all my ideas by any matter of means. But what we know now is that AMD, dry AMD, doesn't begin in the fovea pro proper, in the foveal pit, but indeed it begins outside in the parafovea, where there are abundant rods. Indeed, what we know, of course, is that the fovea is all cone, but just outside the all cone foveal region, there are peaks of rods, the highest number of photoreceptors in the retina. And that's where AMD begins. I think most people would agree with that today. And that was shown beautifully, uh, I guess, about 15 years ago by workers at Moorfields in London who showed that sensitivity in the parafovia was very highly compromised uh, in what they could show was the earliest stages of AMD. And what we think is happening is that the pigment epithelial cells are become, become poisoned by the accumulation of toxic material that I'll come back to in a few minutes. Um, that poisons the pigment epithelial cells, prevents them from supporting then the photoreceptors. First the rods in the parafovea, and then we believe the cones in the central retina. And of course, losing patches of rods in the parafovea doesn't compromise vision very much. But losing patches of retina in the central fovea is devastating doesn't take much of a lesion in the central fovea to cause real problems. Indeed, the guess is, and I think our uh, n new electron microscopic observations, the connectomic observation, suggests that it's the patch of very central cones, maybe only two or three hundred cones, that provide us the very highest acuity. And one would have assumed that it was many more cones than that, but uh, it uh, is amazing how quickly uh, ear acuity falls off from that very central patch of cones. Okay, so um, probably we think that the um, disease starts in the parafovea and then spreads both laterally and centrally. But when it hits the central retina, that's when the difficulties really begin. So what's the nature of the toxic material? Well, what's different about photoreceptors. Well, what we know, of course, and this goes back to my student days and being with George Wald, is, is that the light-sensitive visual pigments consist of vitamin A, aldehyde, chromophore, okay, and uh, a protein. Aldehydes are very toxic materials, mm -hmm. and so when you bleach your visual pigment, expose it to light, what happens is the aldehyde, which is bound in the protein, comes off. Most of it we know is sequestered mm -hmm. by the protein of the visual pigment themselves or other proteins, but some of it certainly seems to escape. Mm -hmm. And that that escapes then is capable of forming uh, compounds called bisretinoids mm -hmm. uh, with uh, even membrane lipids, the membrane lipid that has been most uh, commonly implicated is a phosphatidylethanolamine. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it forms a compound that eventually will become a substance called A2E that we know gets in the pigment epithelium sure. that has been shown to poison um, lysosomes and other 
um, organelles and the pigment epithelium. So uh, we're still learning about this, and, and some people say they don't think there's any relation, but I think we're getting more and more evidence mm -hmm. that the bisretinoids, particularly um, when they're oxidized, mm -hmm. poison the pigment epithelial cells. And I think this is probably the reason that one of the most important risk factors for AMD is smoking. Mm. That causes oxidation. And of course, that's a very sensitive uh, cell, the retinal pigment epithelium. So if you have A2E and you have oxidation caused by smoking or light, light is another risk factor for AMD. Mm -hmm. So photooxidation plays a role. These are my ideas. So, you know, we, uh, uh, a student uh, and, and myself, we set up a small company a few years ago trying to design compounds that would inactivate the retinaldehyde. Mm -hmm. And we were able to show that we could make such compounds that did not cause um, side effects. Uh, and uh, the investors that we had let us take this uh, research that we did, cost the investors about $8 million, all the way through phase one trials. Mm -hmm. And then they lost interest. Mm -hmm. They changed the name of the company. They now are trying to use the, the, uh, the um, uh, compounds that we develop mm -hmm. to treat skin diseases where we know aldehydes also accumulate, mm -hmm. but sort of left us high and dry. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we've designed more compounds to inactivate the retinaldehydes. Unfortunately, we still don't have any uh, support for this, so we need about a million and a half dollars. We're working hard to see if we can find it, but so far we have been uh, unable to do so. I applaud your passion and persistence. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've been at it now for over a decade because it took us eight or nine years to get to the point with our first compound mm -hmm. to get through the phase one trials. Now we've um, uh, designed drugs. Uh, our med chemist who's with us, who has made now compounds that are about a thousand times more uh, effective than the original ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to test their safety uh, and whether in the eye they're as effective and so on and so forth. What about the detection of immune complexes and the role of immunity. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that's been a big story of the complement and so on and so forth. But I would maintain that's downstream of the primary event. Mm -hmm. And what I think we need to get at is what is starting an AMD. Mm -hmm. And a question that you can immediately ask is, what turns on complement expression? complement activation. Well, Dean Bach at UCLA has shown it's A2E, one of these bisretinoids. It very effectively turns on complement. So, you know, if we can find ways to eliminate complement, we will certainly help AMD, but we're not going to cure it. I mean, it's like we heard this morning with regard to Lucentis, and of course, uh, a terrific drug for wet AMD, particularly for the first two years more debilitated than they were to begin with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm looking to find out what's the ultimate cause of the disease and how we can stop it, mm -hmm. cut it off at the pass, if you will. That's what I think we really need to do. And, you know, complement factor, that'll help. It'll deal with some of the symptoms in probably many cases of dry AMD, but it's not going to solve the problem in my view. Well, this is an extraordinary insight, and we wish you a tremendous amount of luck going forward. Okay. Terrific. Thank okay. you, Professor. You're welcome.